Guys, this is going to be a, another quick review uh, about the American Revolution in general. We're going to be kind of hitting most of the main points here that I think you guys should know. So as you probably remember uh, about Lexington and Concord, you ultimately have kind of the first real battle, if you will, of the American Revolution. And news of this is going to spread pretty rapidly around this particular area. And it's going to really bring in a lot of troops that are going to really rally to head to Boston uh, in, in an attempt to kind of be ready for whatever is going to be taking place after this and be ready for a war if that's necessary. Necessary. Uh, but you do have a group of colonists, and you know most of the colonists still really didn't want this to happen. Um, you know most people still really hope to avoid an all-out war, though you know there were groups obviously that were calling for it. You know the rational side of most people was saying that a war would ultimately be detrimental to to the col colonies and the country as a whole, uh, and you know it'd be very it'd be a tough time for everybody. So you have what is known as the Olive Branch Petition that is sent by the Second Continental Congress uh, to King George in England. Um, this petition was essentially a, a hope that the American grievances would finally be heard by the king in, in a desire to really avoid an all-out war. Uh, the king, however, had kind of a different mindset at this point. The fighting had begun. Um, this insurrection, he felt, really needed to be stopped. Uh, and his response to this was actually sending about 20,000 you know, troops to the Americas to really kind of put this revolt and this, this revolutionary mindset to rest once and for all. That was the hope, and hopefully do it rather quickly. After the initial fighting at uh, in Boston, you know, outside uh, at Lexington and Concord, uh, you do have other fighting that kind of breaks out. Um, a group of rebels led by a commander uh, named Ethan Allen, uh, and this group of rebels was known as the Green Mountain Boys, um, pretty much from uh, the the New Hampshire area and Vermont area. Um, you have the Green Mountains in Vermont, so this is kind of what we're talking about. Um, these people, under the command of Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold, actually, went to capture this, this fort that was in command by the British at Ticonderoga. Uh, so Ticonderoga is actually right at the northern end of Lake George in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. Uh, the Adirondacks actually are this, this green map right here, or this green part of the map, I should say. Uh, and Ticonderoga is right about where this hand is at the top, the northern end of Lev Lake George. Um, you have a connection between that and Lake Champlain uh, right here. Um, basically, and it's, it's an important point because these these rivers and lakes and things make good good navigable water um, for movement between uh, New York and even up into Canada if necessary so this group they actually without really waiting for congressional approval actually go in and go surprise attack this fort and capture it uh, and this is going to become really really important because when they get there and when they ultimately capture the fort um, they they do capture a large cont large amount of weapons um, in particular big kind of artillery guns and those artillery guns are really going to be important for the siege of Boston uh, moving forward which we're going to be talking about in just a second so with news of the attack at Ticonderoga uh, and the way things were going, you get a meeting uh, known as the Second Continental Congress. Uh, and this meets and they realize the problems that you're going to have without a really decentralized military uh, and not only really having militias to combat the relatively large British force that is was to be expected. Uh, and in this meeting they actually is when they approve of George Washington as the commander of the Continental Army. Um, George Washington takes this, this post very humbly. Um, he takes it uh, with quotes saying things like he, he, he is not fitting of the, the post that you know, he has been given. Um, some people think this is just his modesty and he, he really, really did want this post um, and that the, sometimes modesty is the best way to, to get what you want. Um, but anyway, take or leave whatever you want to believe about that. But George Washington, you know, after this, is immediately dispatched to Boston to kind of take stock of what is going on up there and you know this is where the the early fighting is definitely and going to be taking place
So up in Boston, before you actually get George Washington to get there, um, you have what is known as the Battle of Bunker Hill, which is actually kind of funny because the battle doesn't actually take place on Bunker Hill. It actually takes place on a on a hill known as Breed's Hill. Um, Bunker Hill is right next door, which is hence the confusion. But um, essentially, you have a colonial militia that gets surrounded, really, by... Uh, the Redcoats by by the British, um, and they get kind of stuck up on this hill um, overlooking Boston, and they are going to tr tr attempted to be driven away by the British. Um, so you basically have about 1,200 of these men about to be attacked by about 2,400 men, and the British general at the time, whose name is Howe, uh, he actually ferries a all of his men across the river, which you're going to see in just a second, um, and they go on to attack. Okay, so uh, what you see here is actually the beginning of the battle. And this is actually going to be an animated um, image here in a second when I move my mouse over to there. Um, but you can see, you know, this is Boston on the on the south bottom end of this map, um, and you have this kind of hill in Charleston, Charlestown, um, overlooking Boston, um, and essentially. The British don't want this because any guns and artillery can just kind of fire right down upon Boston. So what happens is you get the movement of the British troops right down on the eastern peninsula, end of the peninsula right there, uh, which you're going to see once I get this image going, and they're going to move up the hill and take kind of consecutive movements up the hill trying to take this. So let's see what that looks like. So as you can see, you know, the troops are landing right there. Um, they're being engaged by the Americans. Uh, eventually, they're going to have enough troops. They're going to feel comfortable, you know, in making an attack. Uh, the Americans kind of repel them, and they attack again. The Americans repel them again. And ultimately, on the third attack uh, is when they're going to actually push through and force the Americans off the Minute Peninsula and take the hill. So the reason why this is important is actually that, you know, the Americans really, really held their own here. Uh, you know, the British were repelled multiple times, and really, they would have been able to be repelled longer had it not been for the, the Americans, uh, the colonists kind of running out of ammunition. And the British suffered really high losses. When it comes down to it, you had about a thousand uh, redcoat casualties, a thousand Brit British casualties. You know, remember a casualty being either someone who is dead or wounded, um, and this, these, this number of casualties was actually more than double the, the colonists and the American casualties. So you actually had about 200 British killed and about 800 wounded to the point where they wouldn't be able to fight again immediately. And this was a really big morale boost for the Americans. Um, you know, they realized that for a second here that they, they stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British and they actually, on some level, came out on top. You know, they might not have actually held their position, but they, they made the British suffer more than they did. Um, and this, again, was a kind of a mora major morale boost um, going against, you know, really what is the strongest military force in the world at the time. And they were successful. So this fight for Boston is going to continue, and Washington's actually going to arrive and um, kind of help fortify the position, you know, of of the colonists, and really, this is going to be one of Washington's genius strokes here. It's just going to kind of really work out in his favor, um, for sure, and it's going to be really successful. Basically, he sends one of his men, a man named Henry Knox, um, who basically is sent to Ticonderoga, um, and he is kind of tasked with bringing the guns that were taken, you know, in the Ethan Allen assault on Fort Ticonderoga, and bringing them to Boston. Uh, and there's this long kind of trip, you know, hundreds of miles over mountains and across streams and rivers and, uh, you know, through the dense kind of woods of the Adirondacks and the area at the time, and he's very successful and doesn't lose a single man or a single gun and actually gets them to Boston. And these guns are going to be extremely necessary for Washington. Uh, basically, in one night, he gets his army to bring these guns up to the highest area around Boston in a place called Dorchester Heights. And this is going to be really important because it actually, having the high ground 
in, is going to actually force the British to have to leave. Uh, you know, they have this relatively large navy down down in the harbor, in Boston Harbor. Um, you know, the city, they actually have control of the city too, but having these guns that are able to reach either of these at a higher position where the British can't actually get to them um, is going to be a serious problem for the British, and even though, you know, if they had before this, they would have had the upper hand. Um, this is going to actually force them to retreat. And basically, Howe, who is the British general um, here in command, he gathers up his army and he gathers up all of the the people that are loyal to the British crown, um, also known as loyalists, and we'll, there'll be more of that in just a second. But um, he takes them, he brings them on the naval ships, and essentially goes up to Canada, retreats up to Canada, up into what's known as uh, Halifax and, and Nova Scotia, um, which is, I'm just showing you on the map right here of where that is. You know, this is this is uh, Massachusetts right here. So they basically take the ships and kind of um, just head up into Canada where they more or less regroup and decide what they're going to do. But you're also, at this time, now going to have an American invasion of Canada, which is going to be led um, on some level by again, Benedict Arnold, um, who arguably is one of the most underappreciated people of this war early on, um, and his underappreciation on some level is going to drive him to become the traitor that we all um, know the famous story for, but um, anyway, he's in charge heading up to Canada to attempt to kind of gather and gain the support, because remember, these colonies um, you know, in, in Canada are are British colonies as well, and the Americans see them as potential allies, but they're not actually going to be um, super successful. They're going to be um, stopped uh, basically actually on New Year's um, in 1775 going into 1776, and they're going to be forced to, to turn around not completely successfully. Once we kind of started talking about it at the la on the last slide, I do want to kind of just discuss the um, different types of colonists or different words for the colonists um, that we can go over. So the first really um, being what are called patriots. So I think, you know, it, most people know what this means, but a patriot is someone, uh, in this context anyway, a colonist who is essentially going to favor war against Britain, um, and they were determined ultimately to fight for their homes and their property uh, and for what they felt is right and this, this, this patriotic cause of separation from Britain. But on the other end, you have loyalists, which I kind of just mentioned uh, with General Howe bringing the whole, all these loyalists from Boston up into Canada. Um, but these people remained loyal to Britain, right? In many cases, they were typically wealthy merchants and officials you know, of the royal government, and they had a lot to lose if they were, went against Britain. Um, so they didn't go against Britain, and on some level... Um, expecting to, to win, uh, they are going to lose more after the war because they did. So that just kind of stinks for them. But I want to just take a step back and kind of pause from talking about uh, the actions of the war itself uh, and kind of go in to discuss some of the ideas that were influencing the behavior of the colonists uh, and this whole idea of the what's known as the Enlightenment. And I have four, four men uh, pictures, or I should say... Um, paintings right here um, that really deeply influenced the the actions of the colonists. Uh, you have uh, Thomas, in no particular order, you have Thomas Hobbes, Montesquieu, a man named John Locke, and then Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And all of these guys' ideas really influence um, this time period and are going to continue to influence the world, uh, you know, after the American Revolution and with things like the French Revolution uh, and things like that. So just kind of Starting off here, you have uh, John Locke, who really ultimately believes that government is essentially a contract with the people, and that sovereignty does really not necessarily reside with the state, but actually with the people. And his ultimate belief is that if a ruler didn't actually follow this contract with the people, uh, because sovereignty actually lies with the people, they have the right to overthrow their government. Uh, and that's a incredible notion for this time period. Um, he also discusses what's known as natural rights and how everyone, uh, you know, all people have what's known as natural rights, which are life, liberty, and the protection of property. And you've 
this probably sounds very familiar, um, partially because Thomas Jefferson, who is the writer of the Declaration of Independence, is going to really use Locke as a very strong basis for for the actual Declaration. And this idea that you know the government should be there to protect the people, uh, and the government gets its power from the consent of the governed, um, is is really groundbreaking, you know, at this time. So additionally, you have a man named Thomas Hobbes, uh, and Thomas Hobbes is very famous for a particular work known as the Leviathan, and his thoughts are essentially that people are naturally wicked, uh, and that people are in general in a natural state of war, and that people and nations are essentially selfishly motivated and are more or less always going to act in their own self-interests. Um, Hobbes really believes that governments are instituted to protect people uh, you know, from other people's selfishness and wickedness. And you know, his connection to the Declaration of Independence, which we'll be covering kind of more in just a second, you know, it's a bit more subtle than Locke. Um, you know, that, that the, the idea that the power of government should be limited to protecting people from the selfishness and wickedness of others, um, and therefore protecting their rights. So that's that's big too. Um, and he's going to be you know another one of these famous Enlightenment thinkers. You also now have. John Jacques Rousseau, and his major work is called The Social Contract, uh, and he believes essentially that a just society where, are where liberty and legality of things are essentially drawn from the general will of the public, and that a society, society exists really as a result and because of the actions of a group and the general will of that group, and that general will is becomes the, the moral force or authority and really what makes things right and wrong. So the U.S. essentially coming together as a result of the general will of the public, um, you know, are acting you know, to free themselves and act independently from Great Britain are essentially their social contract. And then you have Montesquieu, and Montesquieu, um, his major work is actually called On the Spirit of Laws, um, and he doesn't really have much of an influence on the Declar Declaration of Independence, uh, but his his idea of the separation of powers of government um, and having different branches of government are going to be a major, major game changer and, and major um, thought and taking into consideration when writing the Constitution um, and having the different checks and balances of the different branches. Um, but you know, going a little more into him is he you know believes in that there's three different kind of branches of government. Um, you know, the idea of a monarchy, a uh, republic, or you know despotism. And monarchy again is having a king or queen. A republic is essentially having an elected leader, and then despotism is essentially having a a dictator in charge of things. Let's take a look at the Declaration of Independence a little bit. Um, you know, this is just it. I'm going to read you some of the the passages right here, um, but some of the language is really, really important and really powerful. Um, so, you know, looking at the very beginning here, uh, you know, it's hard to read there. If you look probably closely, you can, but I'm going to read it for you. So, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So, you know, just analyzing this a little bit, you know, the this idea of political bands is their connection to Great Britain, and that this this group, the Americans, you know, this one people are are looking to get rid of these political bands because of because of the things that have been happening to them, and they're not happy with. So ultimately, Jefferson kind of feels that it's necessary to write this declaration because that's something, as he says, you know, there at the end, that something this large and having just decent respect for the other people involved and the rest of the world, it, this this declaration really should be declared, and it should be something that is explained why they are doing such a thing. Going a little farther, um, you know, it says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, 
that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So, you know, this basically is just saying that this should be obvious, right? That everyone, you know, borrowing from Locke has these natural basic rights. Uh, he does change the wording a little bit uh, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, you know, you can compare um, the two to Locke, who says the protection of property, um, which is essentially a thing that's going to make people happy, right? Um, in this day and age and still today. Um, but, Ultimately, he feels that the government should be what protects these basic rights, and that if the government, uh, which b gets its power from the consent of the governed, is in doing this, well then, we need to get rid of that. Reading a bit farther here, um, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So this is drawing from the idea of the social contract, which we just talked about, and also just pulling from, from Locke as well, um, and even Hobbes. It's drawing from kind of all of these Enlightenment thinkers you were just talking about. But that, that idea, again, that if the government is becoming destructive of these natural rights, um, that it's time for them to do something about it is, again, in this time period, such a, a groundbreaking idea, uh, and this is this is treason. What these people are are doing, right? You know, these these people signing this document and signing this paper that if they if they didn't win this war, they very well could have been tried and you know hung for treason um, by the British for for their actions. So this this uh, this whole thing at the end, um, you know, this whole thing is is so. It really is incredible. I um, mean, you know, I you know. I hope you guys appreciate that. The declaration goes into kind of talking about what's known as grievances, um, and these grievances, you know, these horrible things that the the king, uh, you know, had done uh, and that Britain had done to to the Americas. So just kind of mentioning a few of them, you know, the, for for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, you know, discussing the quartering act, um, for protecting them by mock trial from punishment for any murders they should commit on inhabitants of these states, talking about, you know, the intolerable acts and how the British um, would essentially now try their their officials outside of the colonies in a more favorable spot for them, trying to avoid colonial bias, but in the time then getting, you know, British bias, which the colonists were not too particularly happy about. Uh, again, you know, another one for cutting off all trade, you know, with parts of the world, probably, again, discussing the closing off of the port of Boston uh, and the intolerable acts as, as a result of the, the Boston Tea Party. Um, for imposing taxes without our consent, uh, you know, again, going back to this whole concept of no taxation without representation. And then at the very, you know, also another one here, um, in, in every state of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. So this is just going back to the idea that the king is ignoring them um, every step of the way, uh, and that when they're hoping to change and compromise, there hasn't been too much compromise that they are happy with, and that's why they're doing this in the first place part of the declaration, you know, goes to discuss kind of now that they are free, um, that this Ameri America, you know, these, these colonies are now no longer um, part of the British, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that this political connection between them is, is done. Uh, and it goes on to then lastly say, you know, and that as a free and independent state, that the United States would have full power to act as independent states. And some of the things that they would be capable of doing, uh, you know, as being independent now, are this idea, you know, of levying war, of creating war and having a war, um, basically creating peace and concluding peace, uh, making alliances with different different countries, different nations, um, establishing commerce with whatever nations that they see fit, and then lastly, and being able to do whatever they feel an independent nation should be able to do. And I just want to kind of pay attention to the last lines of this, um, and that, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, 
and our sacred honor. You know, I think that last sentence is just is just a really powerful one. I think it just takes should be appreciated. Okay, so taking a step back now into the actual fighting in the war, um, you know, just immediately kind of following the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the open um, declaration of, you know, a free and independent United States, the British are going to make their move into um, the real action here of this war. Uh, you have General William Howe, uh, who we had mentioned, and his retreat from Boston up to Halifax in Nova Scotia, Canada, where he would regroup. Um, he has officially decided upon his plan. Uh, they've regrouped. They've you know got more soldiers and brought their army and navy together, and they decided to make a move on New York City, um, in particular through Long Island. So in August of 1770. About 34,000 British soldiers, uh, 10,000 Navy men, sailors, uh, and this large Navy essentially come in and they land on Long Island and work their way westward on Long Island, uh, essentially catching the Americans um, completely not off guard, they knew they were coming, it's just that they overwhelmed them. Um, the Americans weren't quite ready for the sheer numbers, and you had about 20,000 poorly trained men and no Navy that would be able to kind of stop this invasion, and the Americans get driven back all the way to the westwards, western side of Long Island um, in basically Brooklyn, uh, and you ultimately get the Americans have to call a retreat off of Long Island to Manhattan, um, and this happens late in August, on August 27, 1776, and this is an interesting story in itself. Um, you know, if it wasn't for this very excellent, excellently executed uh, retreat, um, this war might have been over right here. Um, but you do get a Washington calling this retreat and executing this retreat brilliantly that the British didn't really know that this was happening until the next morning when the most of the Continental Army had been moved across the river and onto Manhattan. So, with the Continental Army now mostly on Manhattan, um, you have this fighting continuing really from August all the way into October, um, fighting General Howe's army. And the big thing here, again, is that the British have a large navy and they are able to use that navy um, essentially surrounding Manhattan you know, and, and blocking off the island a bit and this is very problematic for the Continental Army of course uh, and the army basically is forced up up Manhattan uh, and you have you know a number of battles that are taking place you know over these couple of months um, but ultimately the Continental Army again is going to be forced to retreat um, after this last battle on Manhattan known as the Battle of Fort Washington and George Washington uh, with a, a number of his men you know the largest contingent of the men are going to basically be able to again once again retreat and ferried across the Hudson River, uh, essentially right where the George Washington Bridge stands uh, currently today uh, into Fort Lee, New Jersey. And this isn't going to be just over once they get across. You know, these this army is going to be kind of um, pushed and chased really all the way across New Jersey uh, until they again get across the Delaware River and into Pennsylvania where they are a little bit safer. So this brings you to actually one of the most important events of this entire war. Um, you know, the American Army, the Continental Army, had been taking a major whooping ever since the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the morale of the military was really, really down. Um, you know, one thing that's really important to understand is that most of these men, you know, only signed one-year contracts or other contracts that were more or less going to be up at the end of this year. And with morale as low as it was and the cause not looking so great, um, you essentially need to do something here to kind of turn that around and have these people once again be motivated. And Washington, knowing this, actually makes one of the biggest and important contributions to this war uh, right 
here in December in 1776 at what is known as the Battle of Trenton. Uh, you know, and it's this famous story of George Washington, um, again, with his men being able to be ferried across the Delaware River and essentially surprise attacking a group of Hessian mercenaries, uh, basically German mercenaries that were fighting for the British and very easily uh, basically capturing 1,400 men um, without really losing any American soldiers. Uh, and this turns into a major, major morale booster, which is going to kind of have people reconsider not re-enlisting um, at the end of the year. And you now, this major morale boost is going to be the one of the turning points here, because if, if this had not happened, um, again, this cause might have been over um, right here after the, the major defeats on Long Island and in Manhattan and, you know, and, and New York. I um, mean, this is a majorly stunning victory that I, I think, again, it can't be appreciated enough, um, the importance of this. I do want to kind of clear up a common misconception about this as well. Um, you know, one of the stories about how, why the Americans did so well in particular was that the Hessians uh, were essentially had been celebrating Christmas the night before and they were largely drunk and hung over so that when the Americans made their move in the morning um, they essentially weren't ready for them and this is uh, largely untrue this is really not true at all um, you know it's really I just wanted to kind of dispel that myth right there that it wasn't really about alcohol they really did just kind of catch them off guard uh, and they weren't really ready for the Americans, which is why they had such a major effect on, on the Hessians being able to take them in the manner that they did. The Battle of Trenton is really going to be followed up uh, by another battle, which is going to be a really important one for the Continental Army as well. And essentially in a one-two punch um, between these two battles, you also get the battle at Princeton. And in January 1777, this is going to be really important because it's going to give the Americans a bit of momentum, you know, going into this winter between 1776 and 1777. And, and you, if you remember, you know, these winters, you know, basically because of the way wars were fought, fighting in the winter really didn't make sense. Uh, you would lead, lead your guys to exposure, and that would lead to a lot of deaths uh, and people being killed and such, and it just didn't really make sense. So this, people really thought this was going to be about over, uh, but with Trenton being captured, you get the British really attempting to take that back before the end of this campaign season, and it's going to, again, leave Washington with a bit of a chance to kind of make, continue making a name for himself, and it's in this famous move, Washington essentially fo fools the British general, uh, William Cornwallis, leaving campfires burning overnight. Basically, they were ready to go, you know, they were across from each other a good ways. They could see each other's campfires at night. And in the middle of the night, Washington basically leaves a few people behind to tend these fires and keep them going. But in a large flanking move goes around Cornwallis uh, and heads toward Princeton where the rear guard of Cornwallis's army was waiting. And they basically catch these guys again, um, you know, by surprise, and they're able to attack the much smaller force and rout the much smaller force and win this battle again. And this is really going to give the British generals a little bit of something to think about, and they essentially leave New Jersey from here at this point, kind of fearing more losses, and this is going to kind of be the end of this campaign season, you know, of 1776 going into early 1777. The British need to kind of think of a new strategy of how to handle this. Uh, you have these couple losses there at the end of that, uh, you know, going into the winter, and they're going to regroup and kind of think of how to, to handle the war going forward. And the British officials really were not necessarily happy with the progress, you know, at this point. They, they knew things had gone really well, uh, but those last minute losses there at the end were unsuspected, and it really just made this war seem like it's going to take now a whole lot longer than they anticipated and there were you know numerous times where they felt that Washington and the Continental Army really could have been finished off you know in New York and on Long Island and such uh, and they were had been allowed to escape a couple times now so they really thought it was time for a little bit of a different approach and you get this now other general named John Burgoyne and he has this idea and a new plan kind of to achieve victory and the thought is that by cutting off New England from the other colonies this would 
really caused the war to end a whole lot more quickly. And by cutting off, you know, the northern colonies, the New England colonies along the Hudson River, uh, you could basically prevent them from getting the supplies and resources that they would need, and then kind of pick and choose where you're going to attack, uh, be basically from the, the herding people in the north. So that the plan was to attack Albany, uh, which is the capital of New York, along the Hudson River, about mm, 100 miles or so north of New York City. And they were going to do this from kind of three different sides. And they would stop the flow of supplies and soldiers across the Hudson River with the Navy that they that they have command of. The plan was for General Howe to really march to Albany from New York City. Uh, additionally, John Burgoyne and another British general named St. Ledger would come down from Canada and ultimately attack Albany. And between them, they would actually take Albany from three different sides. Uh, what really happened is General Howe didn't really necessarily agree with this, and he was kind of pursuing Washington himself, and he decides to march to Philadelphia and end up wintering, uh, you know, there and staying down there and kind of continuing his campaign around Philadelphia during that year. Uh, General St. Ledger actually kind of got stuck. Uh, he ended up trying to take a different fort nearby, and it ultimately leaves John Burgoyne with a relatively large portion of the British army all by himself. You get one of these next turning points of the war known as the Battle of Saratoga. Uh, you have Burgoyne working his way down from Canada, actually retakes Fort Ticonderoga, um, but after that he kind of begins to experience some troubles, right? This is some really rugged area, you know, it's, it's tough to move, and the American forces are aware of him, and the, the Green Mountain Boys, again, and, you know, American men are able to actually surround John Burgoyne and his army at Saratoga, and in doing so, they're actually able to, to force a surrender of, of Burgoyne and his entire the army that he was in command of in October in 1777, and this is really an important battle because after another year um, of really kind of a back and forth effort, um, this is a major turning point because it's going to convince France to ultimately jump into this war as on behalf of the United States as an ally and begin sending aid. And remember, you know, the French have more or less been enemies with the British for a long time, so this is them taking a chance to kind of stick it to the British, especially, um, you know, since they had really just lost the Seven Years' War um, not that long before this, which we had already talked about. As I mentioned previously, General William Howe uh, was the, one of the men who didn't head north to help John Burgoyne. He went to decide to take Philadelphia instead, uh, and he does. Uh, he ends up taking the city uh, and has major wins at what's known as the Battles of Brandywine, Brandywine and Germantown. Uh, but this is ultimately going to force the Continental Army you know, outside of this Philadelphia area uh, and not in the city itself where they could have had a nice winter being warm you know, in these, these houses and such that are in Philly. Um, but they're forced to winter instead at a place known as Valley Forge. And this is going to be bittersweet to the Continental Army a little bit. It's really a really difficult situation that they are put into. This winter ends up being a, a really big winter, a really doozy. Um, you have lots of snow. It's really, really cold. Uh, you know, these people, they they make these huts, uh, you know, they're 12 feet by about 16 feet. You know, they hold about 12, uh, you know, enlisted men in these huts. Uh, many of them are just kind of sleeping on the frozen ground. You have some people that are just not adequately clothed. Uh, it's starving, you have famine in the camp, and you're just looking for supplies, and the conditions in the camp really deteriorate pretty quickly. You know, many men were already injured from these battles, and they're going to be suffering. You know, they're going to be dying from these diseases, and, and the cold, and the exposure, uh, but, you know, one thing that happens is that you get supplies kind of being sent from all over the colonies to kind of help the, the Continental Army get through this really tough winter. And eventually the weather does subside a little bit, and you are going to get a man named Baron Friedrich von Steuben, and he is a Prussian uh, military man who 
had been recommended to Benjamin Franklin uh, as a way and a resource to kind of help the Continental Army get into kind of a fighting shape and become a more efficient and effective army. And he does. He actually does this a, a very, very well. Uh, and he really is one of the main reasons why coming out of Valley Forge you're going to have a much more stable uh, much more effective continental army force so as I said kind of in the beginning of this this winter is kinda of, kinda of be bittersweet because of the conditions that they had to to experience but also coming out of it they are going to be a little bit more better equipped to handle uh, the fighting against the, the world-class military that was the British. So again, taking a kind of minor step back for a second from the actual fighting of the war, I just want to kind of briefly talk about uh, two different things. One, you know, the women's role in this war to begin with, but also the African-Americans' role uh, in this war. It wasn't just all white men that were fighting, uh, and I think that's really important to understand. So. When it comes down to it, just like in really any war, when men go off to fight, women are going to really really pick up a lot of the slack on the home front. Uh, you know, the, the women did what they needed to do. You know, in many cases, they were harvesting the crops themselves. Um, they were helping to supply the army. The, the military on the Continental Army with blankets and uniforms and things like that. Uh, in many cases they even ended up as nurses, you know, where they would care for the wounded, they would cook for them, uh, they would wash soldiers' uniforms, uh, you know, just to, to help out wherever they could. Uh, and, you know, the again, I think the home front in most wars is something that's really often overlooked and often one of the just as vital aspects of of the war, right? If there was no one at home helping to harvest the crops and, and get this food and things like that to the men on the lines, uh, you know, th how could you sustain a war effort? And that's, you know, really important to, to kind of grasp. And there's one famous woman I kind of want to talk about, uh, much, much of, most of you have probably heard about. Her name is Molly Pitcher, uh, and she's famous for carrying water to soldiers actually at a battle that took place in New Jersey at the Battle of Monmouth uh, and she's famous mostly because when her husband uh, falls uh, and dies in the battle um, she actually takes up his role uh, when he falls and picks up his arms and you know fights helps fight in the battle herself and African Americans as I said too were were important to this war you know there this was a large group of men that really can't be uh, you know undersold and it really all starts with the British offering freedom to male slaves that would really kind of fight in the, the British army and serve the king. Uh, the colonists, they had to respond. Uh, if they didn't, you know, this is a, a whole group of men that would essentially turn their back on, on the Americans because why wouldn't they, right? If they're being offered their freedom uh, when this war was over, that's a really good thing to persuade someone. Uh, so the Continental Army, they also kind of allow this. You know, they're going to allow the African Americans to join the army, uh, and you know, these men would also be granted their freedom after a term of service. And you're going to get a, a group of about 5,000 African Americans fighting in this war, um, you know, throughout the time of the whole war, and about 2,000, you know, in the Navy as well from really most of the colonies all around acting as uh, privateers in, the, in this army, in this navy, sorry, um, on the seas, helping out wherever they could, disrupting British shipping and things like that, because the Continental Army didn't necessarily have a, a real, real navy like the British did. There are a few African Americans uh, that are kind of big names that we talk about, uh, one here being Crispus Attucks, who was actually one of the first casualties really in the war, if you consider the Boston Massacre, um, you know, as part of this conflict, uh, he, wa he was killed in the Boston Massacre, uh, you know, it's just important to kind of think about that. Uh, otherwise, you have this man named James Armistead, who had been a slave, he ends up kind of turning into a spy and really helps and acts as a double agent for the Americans, kind of, um, you know, letting them know what, what was going on for, I mean, the British were doing acting as a spy. You also have two other guys, um, one named Peter Salem and another named Salem Poor, which were you know, men that were basically help, helpful in fighting uh, at the battles of Bunker Hill and you know, ultimately the battles for Boston. Uh, and you know, they're just two other names that are, are talked about as well. So winding down here now, uh, with so most of this fighting going on in the north, things are going to kind of now change and you're going to have a little bit of a different strategy. You're going to 
have the British deciding that this war should be fought in in the South. Uh, you're going to have a, a man named William Cornwallis heading to the South with another large contingent, contingent of men uh, hoping to take advantage of a really high loyalist population in the South. And they move in and quickly they actually capture uh, Savannah, Georgia and Charleston, South Carolina uh, rather quickly. And the thought is that they are going to kind of come up from the South and they're going to kind of pincer and pinch George Washington's army between uh, the British army in the north and the one you know coming up from the south and that this would ultimately end the war uh, once and for all. But this is going to end up biting the British quite a bit actually uh, and the ties are going to be turned pretty quickly when you're going to get a group of southerners really acting in with guerrilla tactics frustrating the British in, in these areas that the British weren't necessarily familiar with. Uh, guerrilla tactics are really quick strike tactics where they're going to you know attack supply lines, they're going to just be in and they're going to be out. And they're not necessarily going to fight them in a, in a manner in which the British want to be want to fight, you know, as lining up on these fields and fighting them uh, man to man. Uh, the, this is obviously the way the British want to fight with artillery and everything, but these quick strikes uh, are ultimately really effective in disrupting the British supply lines and, and stopping the British movements uh, and not really allowing them to move through the south as quickly as they wanted to. And you're going to, you know, after those initial losses, you're going to basically be able to secure some victories here in the south and the biggest victory ends up being what's known as the battle of yorktown which is really going to be the end of the war in 1781 general cornwallis actually ends up allowing his military to get trapped against the atlantic ocean and this is at yorktown and basically the french arrives uh, and you have the American army kind of coming at them from one side uh, and the French basically block off any hope of escape uh, that they would have had which they were hoping to be able to do uh, by just popping into their you know their ships and basically moving to wherever they needed to and this is going to actually force Cornwallis to surrender at Yorktown and this is going effectively going to be the end of the war and the reason it's the end of the war is that this war was always meant to be a quick one from the British perspective it was ne never really meant to last very long so as this war dragged on and on and on the officials in Britain especially in Parliament are not too happy with that. Uh, you know, it costs money and things are you know, going on at home that it's really popular support of this war is going to drop drastically for the British. And when you get another section of the British military having to surrender here, I mean, it wasn't the whole British military, but it was another large enough portion that the officials in Britain really just decided this really wasn't worth it anymore and they officially surrender and are going to be signing what's known as the Treaty of Paris uh, you know a couple years later. So the Treaty of Paris is actually signed on April 15th 1783 so just about two years after uh, the surrender at Yorktown with all things being finalized and officially the United States is now going to be recognized by Britain as an independent nation. And there are a couple other terms and stipulations of, of this treaty as well that we're going to be talking about here. For, for one, really the United States is now just basically more or less the same borders that the colonies had in the first place. Right? The United States is going to extend from the Atlantic Ocean to the western boundary that they had at the Mississippi River. Uh, the northern border, uh, it's not going to go all the way up into Canada, because even though that those northern colonies were, um, you know, British at the time, uh, but you're going to basically have the boundary at what is the modern boundary, more or less, and going through, you know, the Great Lakes. The southern border is actually going to be stopped at Florida, which is going to be returned to Spain for the time being. And the last stipulation is actually that the United States was going to have to pay the loyalists for the property that they had lost in the war. Uh, and this was going to be ignored in most cases by a lot of the states. It, you know, They didn't necessarily do this, um, but it was a thought that they, they had hoped to do this and that they wouldn't be punished for their actions um, helping the crown.
on that note, I hope you enjoyed this one, and it helped give you a good idea about the American Revolution. So I will see you next time.